go live. And I think we're live. All right. Hello, families of faith. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Also, I want to say hello to those of you who join us online every week. Thank you for faithfully joining us week after week. You know, as human beings, one thing I'm pretty sure we could all agree on is we don't like waiting, do we? Not too many people like waiting. I've never heard anybody say, I really enjoy waiting in lines, or I, wait, I enjoy waiting for this to come or that. We don't like enjoy waiting. We're also very impatient, aren't we? For some reason, it's just the way we are. Being rushed is not fun either, is it? For some reason, I feel like all those emotions I've had in the last hour, rushed, patient, waiting, all of it. You know, the other day, I got to work on my van. Nothing major was needed, just some brake pads and some rotors. And like any job, the front two brakes went great, the rear driver's side went great, and then I got to the rear passenger side. And as I was starting to take the rear drum apart, to disassemble it, I could hear all the parts from the emergency brake inside the drum starting to fall apart on their own. Now, if you ever worked on a car, immediately you know this is a problem. Because the springs on the emergency brake came apart, causing the emergency brake to explode open, holding the drum in place. It resulted in the drum being frozen. I mean, I couldn't push it back to assemble it and take it to a mechanic, and I couldn't take it off to finish the job that I was doing. As I sat there in my garage thinking, what do I do now? sat there for about 20 minutes just trying to figure this out. All of a sudden, I remembered that over two decades ago, over two decades ago, I bought this giant bearing puller. I mean, the thing's about this big. And I bought it for a job, and I never used it. So I went into my toolbox, and I went in the bottom drawer of the toolbox. That's where I keep all the specialty tools that rarely ever get used. Now, these are tools that don't get used often, not because they're not good tools, they don't get used often because they are very special tools made for a very special and specific purpose. So I pulled out this giant bearing puller that weighs almost 15 pounds by itself. And I hooked it up to the drum, and instantly I was able to free the drum from the emergency brakes, which gave me the opp opportunity to put everything back together, complete the job with this very special tool that I bought decades ago and never used. Now, in case you guys haven't noticed, or some of you might have noticed, for the last two weeks, we've been in another sort of sermon series that you might have realized we haven't been in. We've been looking at the temptations that face senior Christians. We looked at the temptation of having a critical spirit, like those ten spies that said they could not possibly obtain what God already had promised them. And we've seen how Caleb, 45 years later, at the age of 85, was able to take the land that God had promised them. Last week, we looked at the temptation of spiritual retirement. And we looked at the dangers of what could happen when one starts to think like Samuel. Remember, the Bible tells us that Samuel grew old and appointed his sons as leaders of Israel. We heard how they were wicked, dishonest, perverters of justice, and how nothing but problems came from the decision that Samuel made on his own. Now, if you stop and think about it, all throughout the sermon series on the book of Ephesians, and for the last eight months or so, we keep hearing in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Now, that's the message we keep hearing, and I know it might sound wonderful to some of you, and I say some of you, because the others, that message just might make you frustrated. Think about it. I say it might make you frustrated, and this is understandable, 
Because I too and many people have been there before. You've been saved for years, maybe even decades. You pray to the Lord over and over again for guidance, direction, and for instructions for your specific calling in life. And year after year goes by, decade after decade, and you're like that bearing puller that I own. Yes, you were bought. You were bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for a very specific purpose. But maybe you haven't been used yet. Anyone here ever feel like that? You know you're redeemed. You know you're God's handiwork. And you feel like you've been left sitting on a shelf or in a drawer, just waiting and wanting to be used. And perhaps you're starting to doubt that you are important, that you're an important part of the body because you haven't been used. This is another danger, another temptation that faces many senior citizen, seniors in the church. The temptation to believe that you're worthless because you haven't been used yet. I've heard it many times from many different people telling me that they know they are saved. They know that they're part of the body, and they know that they could be used by God. And they wait year after year, hoping and praying for something that they think is never coming. If I could tell you, if tools could talk, I'm sure that bearing puller would have been happy to finally been used. And as I put it away back in its drawer, if it had the ability to speak, it would be saying, what a wonderful tool I am. Because without that bearing puller, my van would have never left the garage unless it got dragged out by a tow truck. So today we're going to be looking at two very specific things found in God's word. The first is instructions found in the book of Titus. And the second thing we're going to be looking at is the testimony of Simeon found in Luke chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 2, we're told, Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and, sound, and sound in faith and love and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live their life, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and to be pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be the subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Now that message right there is a sermon in itself. But what I want us to focus on is the fact that we are called not to have a temper, to live a life that calls for respect, to be self-controlled, to be sound in faith and love. And I could tell you how absolutely beautiful it is that I could see those attributes in all of you. If you think about it and you look at the younger generations, and I'm not talking about the youth in school. I'm talking about youth in ages 19 to 60. I have seen tempers, lives that don't demand full respect, the lack of self-control and even the lack of love. But what you guys show me is that with age, a true commitment to the Lord, and a willingness to be who God called you to be, you're able to honor those teachings found in Titus. But there's one in there that's equally as important, if not more important, and that's to have endurance. To have endurance means to have the power of enduring an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way. It means having the ability to withstand the wears and tears of life on this earthly tent that we live in. 
It means being able to take a stand and stand to the end. And let me make it very clear that endurance is not just for the physical aspects of the body. Endurance is equally, if not and more important, for the mind. Remember the message of Ephesians. Quit living like Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Likewise, this doesn't just go for the man. It also goes for the woman, as the scriptures say, so that they can teach the younger women how to live in the ways of the Lord. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul wrote to the people and he said, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you? to keep you from obeying the truth. Now, there's many circumstances that Paul was addressing, but likewise, that question is valid for all of us here today. It's valid especially to those who stop believing that they can be used by God because of their age or their disabilities. When applying that scripture in Galatians 5 to Samuel's life, The who cut in front of Samuel was himself. It was himself. He said that he grew old, and he decided to appoint leaders, and nothing good came from that. You know, when I pulled that bearing puller out of the box after two decades of sitting in a drawer, that bearing puller did exactly what it was intended to do. When Caleb basically sat on a shelf for 45 years. And for when it was time for him to go and receive the promised land that God gave him, he went and he slaughtered those giants and he took the land that God had promised him. Nothing cut in front of him because he endured to the end. He held on to the promise of what God had told him, which leads us to another testimony. This testimony is of a man named Simeon, which is found in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what he, what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sights of all the nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and to the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother were marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now if you stop and think about that, that's it. That was his life. That's all we know of his life right there. If you want to talk about being set apart for a specific purpose and not being used for many, many, many decades later, Simeon's a great example. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us his age, but when you look at the wording, it's very specific. When the time came, 
wasn't Simeon's time, it was God's time. When the time came, the people of Israel, including Simeon, were waiting for the promise of God. And Simeon had an advantage. God specifically told Simeon that he would not die before seeing the Messiah. It's kind of an advantage, isn't it? God told him that he would not die. Remember last week I said that everything God says is a promise from him? God is not like us, using words loosely. If God says it, he means it. Do you guys believe that? Do you believe if God says it, it's a promise and that he means it? Good, good, because listen to this. You are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do his good works, which God has planned in advance for you to do. That's the truth. If you stop and think about that, and you think about Simeon, his reputation was that of being righteous and devout. Being righteous and devout to the Lord. If that's who we are, then we too will not die before the Lord uses you for the specific purpose he created you for. Simeon knew what he knew. And what he knew was that God told him that he would see the Messiah with his own eyes. For it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he seen the Lord's Messiah. And we know God promised us that we are his handiworks to do his good work. We don't know when God told this to Simeon or how long he waited to see the Messiah with his own eyes. But, we do know, but what we do know from this passage of text is that Simeon stood on one truth of God. And that truth was that he would see the Messiah, and indeed he did. And once he did see Jesus, Simeon said, you may now dismiss your servant. Now we don't know the age of when Simeon passed away. But Jew Jewish historical records recorded him dying at the age of 127 years old. 127 years he waited for the purpose that God had for his life. And what a purpose that was. To be the first human being on earth to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, if you stop and think about that, that's huge. To be the one to hold Jesus in your hands and say, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for the revelation to Gentiles and the glory to your people of Israel. Think of how precious that moment must have been. Think about when you hold a newborn baby in your hands, how precious it is just to have the opportunity to hold a child in your hands. Yet Simeon wasn't just holding a child. He was holding the Messiah in his hands. And that's what he is known for. There are countless testimonies like Simeon's in the Bible about many people who had waited for many years for God's perfect timing. Stop and think about it. Abraham, at the age of 75 years old, waited another 25 years to have his first child and for the prime promise of God to start to become complete. From the time Joseph's brothers plotted to kill him, threw him in a well, and sold him into slavery. Joseph waited another 22 years for the promise that God gave him. Moses, Caleb, and Joshua waited 45 years until the point Caleb was 85 years old when the promise came to be. 
Young David was anointed by God himself to be king. And he waited 22 years before actually taking the throne. Jesus, Jesus himself, waited on earth for 33 years before starting his ministry. And we know that Jesus is perfect, and we are not. And if that's the case, don't you think that we're going to have to wait a little bit for God to work on us so he could have us equipped for the calling that he has for us? From those testimonies and countless others in the Bible, we can see how God can still use us despite of age or physical limitations. But the one thing is we must remember that it's in God's time, not ours. And if it's in God's time, not ours, there's going to be some waiting, isn't there? We're going to have to be patient. Because the truth is, the promise of God is, we are, we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus. And Jesus himself tells us in John chapter 14, verse 13, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. We've heard this before. We know this is true. But what many of us fail to realize is that the verse doesn't say that Jesus will do it when we ask right now, does it? None of us know God's timing or why sometimes it seems to take so much longer than we'd like. But the truth is we need to rest in the truth that God is faithful. In fact, God tells us in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. In Psalm 27, 14, we're told, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, we're told, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, God addresses and talks about the trials and temptations we face. And he tells us, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When you look at this scripture, it tells us it's going to take time. There's going to be waiting involved. And in the process of waiting and overcoming the trials and temptations that God is going to be working on us, and as he works on us, we'll begin to grow in maturity. But it's going to take time. Yes, God does give us visions. He gives us dreams. He gives us promises for our lives. He redeems us. He sanctifies us and he anoints us. But he does it in his perfect timing based on his perfect plans, not ours. And while, yes, not knowing the time can be frustrating, that doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter because we already know the promises. And that's what matters. We stand on the promises of what God tells us. There are going to be times in our life that we want to give up. But as long as we know and we hold on to the promises that God tells us found in his word, then we should be able to accept that God's timing is perfect. 
We know that God has plans for our lives. And those plans are good. But it's in His time, not ours. Now, ladies, I see you shaking your head, so it's perfect timing. <laughs> ladies, if any of you know the testimony found in Luke chapter 2, then you know that's not the rest of the testimony, is it? It's not. Because in Luke chapter 2, continuing in verse 36 and following, we find that there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. That's what the Bible says. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying, coming to them at the very moment she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. We can't forget about Anna, can we? The so let's look at the differences real quick between Simeon and Anna. The Bible starts out by telling us that Simeon was a man. But it tells us that Anna was a prophet. Now, while, yes, Simeon was old, Anna was very old. Simeon was the tool that was promised by God and led by the Holy Spirit for the very specific person of being the first to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah. And how Anna comes into the picture is a testimony itself. Now Anna was a prophet that tells us that she was already being used by the Lord. The Bible says that now she was very old and that she never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying, coming to them at that very moment. At that very moment, when Simeon was led by the Spirit, when Mary and Joseph brought their child Jesus to, re to, to fulfill the law that God put in place, Anna happened to be there. Coming to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke to them about the child. Now, have you ever heard the saying, being in the right place at the right time? Anybody ever hear that before? Being in the right place at the right time? Let me tell you that Anna was in the right place at the right time. Even if you don't know your specific purpose in life, your specific calling, just being in the presence of the Lord, in His house, worshiping Him day and night, praying and being obedient to God's instructions, you could wind up smack dab in the middle at that very moment of what God is doing. And inv inadvertently, out of nowhere, just by being faithful, you get to be part of what God is doing. Anna, by her faithfulness to worship the Lord day and night, found herself right in the middle of a very giant movement of God. God has not told you what your specific calling is like he told Simeon, then be an Anna, right? It's that simple. Be an Anna. Be faithful to the Lord and his teachings day and night. Live in his presence, and you will find yourself in the right place at the right time. So as we begin to close, let me just say that all throughout the Bible, God tells us that as seniors, you're important. You're more than important. You're a necessity. As younger beings, as younger Christians, we need your voice of experience 
We need the warmth of your love, the force of your examples, and the testimonies of your perseverance to encourage and guide us. My prayers are, I hope, that you start to realize that God has you here for a purpose, that you are his handiwork, and that you might have been here all along for a time such as this, for something that God is starting to do now, something that he's been working decades and decades for and preparing. And he says the time is now. We know God has plans for us. We just don't know what they are and when they might be. But if we are righteous and devout, if we never leave God's side and we worship him day and night, fasting and praying, our time will come. And when it does, we'll know it comes because the Holy Spirit of God will prompt us and guide us to the works that God has for us. But in the meantime, there are four things that we could keep doing while we're waiting for our orders from God. The first thing is we need to keep on praying. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Keep on praying. We also need to keep on serving. Romans 12, 11 says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual forever serving the Lord. Never be lazy, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. We need to keep on planting seeds. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 6, we're told, Sow your seed in the morning and at evening. Let your hands not be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that or whether both will do equally well. And we need to keep trusting in God's promise. All his promises. Promises like the ones that are found in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. These are what we need to be doing if we don't have our marching orders from God yet. Keep on praying. Keep on serving. Keep on planting seeds. And keep on trusting in the promises of God. Because the truth is, God is working in front of the scenes. Often we say behind the scenes. Something's happening. But it's not behind the scenes. We're behind the scenes. God's in front of the scene. And God is working in front of the scene. And we cannot even begin to imagine what it looks like. But we simply just need to have faith and trust that God has nothing but his best for us. And what he says is best, is it not? Amen. Amen. I know it's hard. I mean, even... Even at my age, which is not as close to you guys yet, but getting there. And I say it's not about the age for me, it's about the mileage, the pain in the body, the lack of the capacity of the brain to do what it's supposed to do. All these issues that I face every day, every day I wake up, I'm tempted with the temptation of wanting to give up thinking, I don't know what's next. Not knowing where we're going to go with this. And guess what? I don't know those things, do I? We don't know those things, do we? But we have a promise from God that we are His handiwork, created in His Son to do His good works. We don't know what those works look like. We don't know when they're going to come. They could be today, tomorrow, next year or even two or three decades from now. But God promises us that they're going to come. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Let us close in prayer. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for 
being patient with us, for dealing with us, for guiding us and correcting us, for always showing us the way, even when we start to walk off your path. Father, I thank you, Lord, for loving us and entrusting us with your mission here on earth. I thank you for giving us the abilities to be successful in the things that you call us to do. Father, I know that for many of us, we don't know what you have for us. We don't know when your time's going to come for us. But we know the promises that you tell us. And those are what we're going to stand on, Father. We're going to stand on your truths. And I just pray for, m for myself and my brothers and sisters that when our time comes to be used by you, that our hearts and our minds can be open to hear your Holy Spirit guiding us and prompting us to move. Father, thank you for giving us not just salvation, but the ability to be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Barry, you could go ahead and stop the video. Rick.